In our last session, we explored uh, how the 19th century atheists, in seeking to understand why mankind seems to be incurably religious, that they came up with uh, multiple theories that would say that religion is a result of the inventive, creative imagination of human beings who simply don't have the moral courage to face the cold, stark reality of the ultimate meaninglessness of human life, so that there is a psychological impulse, a psychological need out of which, in order to escape grim reality, people formulate for themselves in their own comfort the idea of a God who hopefully will rescue them from meaninglessness. Now, when I mentioned at the beginning of this course how I used to teach a course in uh, atheism where I uh, required my students in the graduate school to read the primary sources of the atheists and that as we analyzed them, I looked at the epistemological patterns that we've explored, questions of the uh, causality and uh, rationality and so on. But also, if you recall those earlier lectures, I mentioned that almost to a man, the critics of theism came back to this principle that the real impetus for theism is grounded in human psychology. And because of that, uh, several years ago, I undertook to write a book for lay people to give them a brief introduction to some of these uh, skeptical philosophers and to show how the New Testament responds to it. And the original title of this book, which is now in paperback, was called The Psychology of Atheism. The title now is, If There's a God, Why, they, why Are There Atheists? In other words, I'm playing on the principle we talked about the last time, where the 19th century skeptics were saying, if there is no God, why are there theists? And their answer was, psychological need. And so I'm asking in this book, if there is a God, why are there people who deny His existence? And so on. And uh, early in the book I have a discussion of why it is that great thinkers disagree. We've mentioned that in the past, that uh, some of the most brilliant thinkers in all of history have come to both ends of the pole, though I radically disagree with Jean-Paul Sartre in his understanding of reality, I certainly don't think that he's a dummy. Jean-Paul Sartre was one of the most insightful, engaging, acute thinkers of the modern era. And certainly John Stuart Mill was also uh, a giant in terms of his intellectual uh, power. He was uh, prodigious, obviously, as was Kant and Hume and Feuerbach and the others, Nietzsche. And yet on the other side of the coin you have people like Aquinas and Augustine and Anselm and the Titans, historically, who have defended uh, the theistic arguments. And so it's not just a question of superior intellect, uh, that the difference among people uh, may be because uh, the evidence was incomplete for one group or the other, or somebody made logical errors, and we know that brilliant people can disagree because of epistemological errors of one sort or another. But I said one of the factors that has to be included in this whole debate is the psychological factor. Let's agree right up front that the question of the existence of God is indeed loaded with psychological baggage. Uh, I was at a soccer game last night, and I was sitting next to a man who was getting more and more exercised by the referee's calls because he felt that the referee was favoring the opposing team. And he asked me about it after the game, and I said, you know, I used to be a basketball referee when I was in seminary, and <clears throat> I can tell you this, that when I was refereeing basketball games with another guy, and if the place was filled to capacity, 
I knew that there were only two people in the whole room who didn't care who won the game. And it was me and the other ref. <laughs> I said, because we didn't have a bias, we really didn't. But everybody else in that room had a bias. And they see plays through that. They anticipate, they think somebody's going to foul the person, and even if they don't touch them, in their eye, they see the foul and want to know why I didn't blow the whistle or so on. And so we know that, and we all have experienced that as we root for our favorite teams in sports and, and the like, that we as people are capable of looking at the evidence through a lens that favors our own bias. And I have to say before the whole world that every bone in my body wants there to be a God. I can't stand the thought that my life is a useless passion. And so I have to admit that it, not only that I have that desire, but I also agree with the skeptics that it is possible for people to construct philosophical systems on the basis of their own desires, on the basis of their own prejudices and biases, and have that cloud their thinking. And I also want to say, in the final analysis, the reality of the existence of God cannot be determined on the basis of what I want to be true. And I agree with the critics of Kant that just because life would be meaningless without God, that's not sufficient grounds to argue for the existence of God. All that really describes is the state of our subjectivity and of our desires. It doesn't prove God one way or the other. But one of the things that I think we have to understand is that everybody who gets involved in the discussion of the existence of God is dealing with the same psychological baggage. Because for those who deny the existence of God, there is an enormous vested interest on their part for the denial of the existence of God. Because God stands as the greatest obstacle in the universe to my own autonomy. If I really want to do my own thing with impunity, then I know that the highest obstacle to that would be a self-existent eternal God who is righteous and who is just. And that I, if I have ever sinned, and have not repented of my sin, I know the worst thing that could befall me would be the fall into the hands of the living God. And so denial is not just a river in Egypt. I will do anything in my power to deny my guilt and to deny my culpability, even to the point of denying that I am accountable ultimately for my existence. Now, again, let me say that if there's a psychology for God that doesn't prove God, and if there is a psychology against God that doesn't disprove God, in the final analysis, arguments for the existence of God have to be established on an objective basis, not on the basis of subjective preference. That's what I've been trying to indicate throughout this series, but I'm taking this parenthesis here to answer the charge that the only reason why people believe in God is out of psychological wish fulfillment or psychological projection. And to make it clear that there is as much psychological pressure or desire for the atheist to deny the existence of God as there is for the theist who wants to affirm the existence of God, so that we can clear the air on that. And the New Testament speaks directly to this issue. On frequent occasions, for example, the New Testament says that fallen man, man in his sinfulness, will not have God in his thinking. That our natural moral condition is to have a reprobate mind, 
a mind that has been darkened, so darkened by prejudice that we do not want to even open the window a crack to allow the rays of God's self-revelation into our head because we know it's at stake. We know we're in trouble if we let that knowledge in there. Now, Paul develops this in some detail in his letter to the uh, church at Rome. And in this book, I give an entire chapter of exposition of Romans 1, and I'm not going to go into all the details of it here, but simply give you an overview and remind you that at the very beginning of this course, we talked that in Romans 1, the Apostle Paul argued that the invisible things of God can be known through the created universe. And I remind, remind you that I told you that there was a collision course between the skepticism and agnosticism of, of uh, Immanuel Kant on the one hand and the affirmations that the uh, Christian ap Apostle Paul <coughs> makes in his literature, where Paul is saying not only can we know God through nature, but in fact we do know God through nature. Now, what Paul is really saying here, and this can be inflammatory if you're not a theist, but at least listen. You can disagree with Paul if you want to. I don't think you can with impunity, but impunity, but if you know, you're not accountable to me, but the point is that what the apostle is saying is that in the final analysis, your problem with the existence of God is not intellectual. It's not because there's insufficient information. It's not because that God's manifestation of Himself has been obscure. Your problem is not intellectual, it's moral. Your problem is not that you can't know God, your problem is that you don't want God. That's what the charge is, at least, from the Apostle. And this is where he lays it out in the first chapter of Romans when he says in Romans 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, let me comment quickly. That very first sentence creates an allergic reaction in many people. The, first, the last thing they want to believe in if, is it's not just they don't want to believe in a God, but they certainly don't want to believe in a God of wrath. I mean, there are many theists, you know, who affirm the existence of God who deny the God that they affirm is capable of wrath. The word that Paul uses is a strong one. It's the word orge, from which we get the English word orgy, which includes a, 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 a violent eruption of passion. What Paul is saying here is that not only is God angry, but He's furious. Now notice that the reason for His anger here that is being made manifest is not that God is angry with righteous people or angry with innocent people, but His wrath is revealed from heaven against what? Unrighteousness and ungodliness. But what we have here in the text is a grammatical construction called a hendiatus where two different words are used to describe the same thing. What the Apostle is saying is, is that there's one particular sin that has, God, has caused God's anger to boil over, and that that particular sin could be described both as unrighteous and as ungodly. And what's the sin? He names the child. 